there was quite an audacious dream. So we created something known as a magic plan, a mentorship and discovery plan. Can we not build an AI-based solution for story? Almost the first question that I get asked is, sir, will AI replace me? My name is Gaurav Rana and I'm a professor at IIT Madras. All my degrees are actually in mathematics. Uh, I did my PhD was in mathematics from the University of Cambridge. And after uh, the PhD, uh, when you do your postdoctoral research, uh, my postdoctoral research was also in the Department of Mathematics from the University of Cambridge. Now, after my postdoctoral uh, research, um, you know, I was at a bit of a crossroads. I mean, one thing was very clear that I really wanted to come back to India. But I was also beginning to get very interested uh, in technology, in particular, how technology could really serve and impact society. In 2008, I visited IIT Madras, and at that point of time, I saw the IIT Madras Research Park. At that point of time, it was in its early stages, but it was uh, functioning, and it was very clear to me that ecosystems like the IIT Madras Research Park would be a great place to actually translate research into real-world impact. And seeing the IIT Madras Research Park really helped make the decision then to join IIT Madras. My research interests are in the broad area of sort of large-scale systems. And examples of large-scale systems would be um, uh, systems like transportation networks uh, or the internet, which we all use. And one of the things that I look at is how can we make these engineered systems perform better. Since about 2014-15, a major part of my research has been now in the area of machine learning and artificial intelligence. What I find particularly exciting, what sort of what really gets me going, is one can actually uh, look at real-world problems through the lens of research and then translate those solutions back into technological or industrial or societal-based solutions which are using technology as a base. So that's something that sort of really gets me excited, sort of uh, interplay between research and industrial slash uh, societal problems with technology as a base. In 2008, there was quite an audacious dream. And the dream was to see whether we can use the mobile phone as an instrument for payments from one bank to another bank. Now, if you recall what the sort of world of telecoms was like in 2008, uh, then we used to have these sort of small, uh, you know, Nokia phones. Uh, calling was expensive, SMS was expensive. In fact, that was the era of missed calls. People used to communicate through missed calls. They used to say, I'll come to your house, I won't call you, I'll miss and give you a missed call, and then you can come back, because that's how expensive uh, it was. In fact, in those phones, there was even a button which you press that button and you had a light which came out. So it acted like a torch as well. In that era, one was thinking about how can we actually use this instrument, a mobile phone, for payments. One of the things to note was this had not been done in the world before. So we didn't have anything to follow. We really had to build it up from scratch. The umbrella organization that was working towards this sort of audacious dream, so to speak, was the Mobile Payment Forum of India. That had all the stakeholders in it. It had industry, it had banks, it had telcos, it had technology solution providers, it had the National Payments Corporation of India, it had IIT Madras as a knowledge partner, and of course, it had the Reserve Bank of India as well. Now that entity essentially helped set the standards for interoperability, for security, and for performance. And those standards were then implemented by the banks. And the first product that actually came out was IMPS. And IMPS and all the learnings that one had from IMPS eventually worked its way into UPI. So it was an enormous privilege uh, to contribute uh, in whatever way I possibly could uh, towards this journey. Uh, I was the first chair of the technology committee and then subsequently the chair of the Mobile Payment Forum of India from 2017. 
Now at the front end, we're probably all using some app or the other to make our payments. It could be the DMAP, it could be PhonePay, it could be Paytm, it could be Google Pay, it could be a bank's application. But essentially at the back end, everybody has to rely on the UPI platform. And in a sense, just to recap, the UPI platform was built from and all the learnings that one had from the IMPS platform. And IMPS was then set up through these standards. Fast forward to today, and it's reached the common man. You can uh, see vegetable vendors, you can see people driving autos, the auto wala. Everybody is basically happy to say, here is my QR code, and you can actually pay me through my QR code. So it's an incredibly democratic solution. It's a solution for everyone. And now there's actually serious interest globally in UPI. Everybody around the world is sort of asking, wow, how did you guys do it? How did you scale it up? How did you actually execute such a solution? So this is now sort of turning into a, something of a sort of global phenomena with a lot of global interest. It's all very inspiring and it does give a lot of confidence that if we can dream, if we can build and if we can execute at population scale a solution like UPI, I think we can build it. There was a lot of experience uh, that uh, I had gained through uh, this sort of payments experience um, and, and in 2022 uh, I was again very privileged uh, to, uh, to be asked to, to take part in the health stack in the sort of digitization process of the, of the health ecosystem and since 2022 I now serve on the technology advisory boards of the Unified Health Interface and of Aishwam Bharat Distribution. Korea was an interesting experience. I mean, not every day you get the sort of opportunity to see a university a sort of built up from scratch. Uh, so I was uh, you know, fortunate to be part of that initial team uh, that was conceptualizing uh, the new university and what it should look like and then also executed and, and sort of uh, get it started. So that started in 2019, uh, where I served as a member of the Academic Council, and I was also chair of the Korea Research Council. Uh, the scope of the Research Council was to uh, set up, think, imagine a research agenda, which was more suited to the needs of the 21st century. An interesting project related to uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence that we started in 2023 was how can we reimagine how we can teach and learn machine learning and artificial intelligence in this digitized world. So we started a digital lab called the RENA AI Lab, it has an acronym of RAIL, where we started developing content which could be used both by students to learn and also by teachers to teach. So in a sense, what we started was uh, experiments on how we could reimagine the classroom in this new digitized world, perhaps for now in the context of machine learning and AI. One of the fun things that we did was we created something known as a MAD plan, a mentorship and discovery plan. And the idea is that instead of a teacher coming and just sort of repeating content, uh, repeating the same content perhaps, uh, sort of year on year uh, in, in the same sort of way, uh, could we then try and see how the role of the teacher can be shifted from not just providing some content but facilitation and mentorship as well within the class. So this was the mentorship and discovery plan where the, the, the faculty, the teacher essentially uh, guides and mentors through a discovery process. And so from a student point of view, uh, we, we hoped that this would be uh, a greater learning experience and then from a teacher point of view, from a faculty point of view, uh, we are assuming and hoping that this would be a more engaging, enriching experience within the class. We've had uh, in, an initial pilot with the Tamil Nadu government, uh, we had an MOU with the Tamil Nadu skill development, and we had some sort of you know, fairly interesting and, and useful feedback. And there are numerous colleges at this point of time which are actually implementing 
and testing these ideas out. Of course, it's early stages. All of this will go through a process of evolution. Uh, but we hope that uh, we can be able to build on this, uh, not just in terms of the pedagogical structure, but even to other engineering colleges across the country. Let me give a sense of an industrial R&D project in, uh, in the space of artificial intelligence, which we started in 2023. Now, we all love stories, and we all fondly remember the Chandramama stories. So we created a small team, or initially a small team, and that was with Swetcha, which is a non-for-profit organization in the technology space, and an industry partner, Ozontel. And we said, can we not build an AI-based solution for storytelling? Can we not do that? And can we not use the Chandramama stories as the stepping stone for this AI-based solution. So in fact, we had more than 10,000 volunteers, students and faculty across 30 plus colleges who actually helped collect and collate the data. Essentially, the team then created an AI-based model for storytelling, Chanda Mama stories in Telugu. And now what we're doing is with the help of researchers and students and IT girls, is actually going to uh, try and scale this across all Indian languages. This is a great example, um, I think, of using local context, local data, to develop local AI-based solutions within the Indian context. These days, Almost the first question that I get asked is, sir, will AI replace me? And I have a slightly sort of anecdotal way of, of responding to that. I, I usually say, no, AI will not replace you. But then I say, you know what? People who are working and building with AI might replace you. If you really want to future-proof yourself, then one way of doing it is to actually build a part of the future yourself. So if we start shifting our mindset from trying to be job seekers to job creators, then I think that is probably one of the best ways that not only you can have a very sort of meaningful and exciting uh, professional life, but a great way to actually future-proof yourself. In terms of the skill set, I'm also often asked, uh, so what are, the, uh, you know, the, you know, what are the skills that one should have to be uh, good or, or great uh, in AI? Um, and I have a point of view, which is that you should have the ability to think like a mathematician, reason like an engineer, and act like a computer scientist. The world around us is turning very complex. And it is important to have a research-oriented mindset to make sense of this complexity. And so the, I don't think that ecosystems like the Antipodas Research Park are great at combining a research-oriented mindset uh, where you have access to professors from IIT Madras, along with industry partners to build out the next generation of AI products and services. today, um, I believe, has an absolutely phenomenal opportunity to use technology to drive growth. Let me put that a little bit in perspective. Over the last 10, 20, 30 years, the West has been very good at providing products and services, except that that has mainly ended up catering for the sort of top 20% of the world's population. India, with its large, young, and aspiring population, can actually go ahead and provide all the solutions that we really need using technology as a base, and then export that solution to the rest of the world as well. So essentially you can cater for the next 80% of the world, which is also going to be very price sensitive. Now looking at sort of 10, 20, 30 years in the future, the sort of technology evolution landscape is going to be driven by digital, artificial intelligence, and quantum. But in order to use them to drive growth, it will be imperative to have the required human capital, which can actually build using 
these technologies, the various solutions that are needed in the country, and then of course, the world stage is your platform as well. The opportunities, of course, are to, to build out um, industrial solutions, solutions that can be used by society, uh, and as I said, you know, used within the Indian context first, and then sort of exported to other parts of the world. In a way, just think of UPI. I mean, every solution does not have to be perhaps uh, of, of that same magnitude, but it was a solution which was devised in India. There was a local context, it's high performance, and it's incredibly affordable. It's a democratic solution. If there were to be a strategic focus, then I think the strategic focus uh, should be on human-centric development. So if you were to use technologies, um, you know, a strategic focus would be to use them towards human-centric development, in particular in education, healthcare, and financial services. And as a country, uh, as I've said, uh, uh, you know, if, we, if we can really uh, dream, build, and scale a solution like UPI, then frankly, I believe we can build anything. In this sort of technology-driven era, ecosystems like the IIT Madras Research Park will, I believe, play a very, very important role in nurturing the technology leaders for tomorrow, for the country, and of course, for the world as well. I am happy to have had the privilege to play a sort of small role within the larger vision and mission of the IIT Madras Research Park. Thank you.